on stage and off, we're exploring some hidden gems of the city's music scene, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Today we're on the campus of Ohio Dominican University, a beautiful place to make music. And you know, music can express so many emotions, love, joy, sorrow, and struggle. Music can also explore issues of identity and belonging, and that's where our focus is today. We want to explore what it's like to belong to more than one community or more than one culture. Our first story is about Ruby Elsey, an African-American singer with roots in rural Mississippi and right here in Columbus, Ohio. Ruby Elsie was one of the pioneer African-American opera singers of the early part of the 20th century. Where is this road leading me to? Ruby Elsie's story is almost um, like a fairy tale. Here is a young black girl who is born in the heart of Jim Crow, Mississippi in the first decade of the 20th century. Father abandons the family when she's only five years old, um, but in large part through the determination of her very devout and hardworking mother, um, she achieved opportunities to get an education. And her big break came in 1927, when as a freshman at Russ College, one of the historic black colleges and universities uh, in the town of Holly Springs, Mississippi, she was overheard singing by a visiting professor from The Ohio State University, Dr. C.C. McCracken. And the president said, well, that's Ruby Elsie. This girl really wants to be a singer, but we don't have the means to train her. And Dr. McCracken decided, you know, I'm gonna see if I can bring her to Columbus, to Ohio State, because Ohio State had just started its Department of Music. Dr. McCracken went back to Russ the next day and said, Ruby, if I can make it possible for you to come to Columbus, would you like to study at Ohio State? And she said, yes, I would, if it's okay with my mother. So he had to persuade her mother, because you're thinking about here is the 1927, and uh, Emma Elsie, Ruby's mother, is being asked to entrust her daughter into the care of a white man she has never met who lives 700 miles away. Um, so it was an act of great faith on everyone's part. Ruby came to Columbus in June of 1927, entered Ohio State that fall, um, studied under Dr. Hughes, who was the founder of the department, graduated with honors in 1930. Dr. McCracken and Dr. Hughes got her then a scholarship to the Juilliard School in New York City. She arrived in New York in, in October of 1930 entered Juilliard and the next week made her debut on Broadway in the chorus of Brown Buddies with Bill Bojangles Robinson. And then in 1935, George Gershwin is um, casting for a first ever American folk opera, as he calls it, Porgy and Bess. 
and Ruby Elsey is one of the singers that he auditions and he casts her after only hearing her sing one song, he casts her in the role of Serena in Porgy and Bess. She makes her debut in October 1935. Ruby Elsey and her co-stars in that show, Todd Duncan and Brown, who played the title roles, all three become very celebrated and Ruby goes on to a wonderful career in radio, in concerts, in films, and uh, even sings um, at the Apollo Theater uh, in Harlem as a headliner. And the great uh, success of her life is singing at the White House at the invitation of Eleanor Roosevelt in December 1937. Her dream, though, is to sing in grand opera. In 1942, she sets her sights on a career in grand opera and is actually given a contract to sing the title role of Aida. But unfortunately, um, she develops a benign tumor, um, undergoes surgery in a Detroit hospital, and for whatever reason, um, dies in surgery. She's only 35 years of age, so it's 1943, and, and as happened so often with so many of the gifted black artists of that time, she kind of like falls through the cracks and for decades um, is just just forgotten and uh, so it was a great joy to me that uh, while I was at WOSU in the late 1990s and got to meet Madge Guthrie who was who was on our board and um, and she and I were talking one day over lunch and she said well David have you ever heard of a singer named Ruby Elsey and I said no I haven't she said well she was a classmate of mine in Ohio State Madge had been in the girls glee with Ruby Elsey in 1929 and uh, so she kind of started me on the whole adventure and it took five years to actually research her story and write it. On the journey now, well, I'm on the journey now. Well, the one who takes nothing, I'm on the for my journey now. My her first radio appearance ever was on WEAO, which of course for anybody that knows the history of WOSU knows that that was the original call letters for WOSU. It's a story that Columbus, Ohio State, and WOSU can all take pride because had she not been able to come here, um, she might have just simply um, been like, as so many other people um, of her race and her generation, you know, just limited to opportunities in Mississippi. But as it was, she went on and had a really stunning career um, that deserves to be remembered and celebrated. Columbus has been described as the new Nashville. Why? Because we've got a strong singer-songwriter community. While they might make the Midwest their home, they write and perform all over the nation. How do they balance the intimacy of music making with the machine that is the music industry? We sent Charlene Brown up north to High Street to find out. Today we're at Natalie's Coal Fired Pizza in Worthington. They make pizzas the old world New York way, cooked in a high temperature, coal fired oven. The crust deserves attention because it's made with a 100 year old sourdough starter for extra flavor. Pick your toppings or try the seasonal pie with locally sourced ingredients hand picked by the staff. Be sure to check out their calendar too because six nights a week, musicians take the stage and Natalie's is fast becoming a nationally ranked venue for acts across the country. I'm meeting Eric Nesda for lunch. He's a longtime Columbus-based musician, plus he hosts a nationally syndicated show called Songs at the Center. Have you ever had Natalie's before? No, this is the first time I've been to Natalie's. How's that pepperoni? Mm. Very good. Man, this is good pizza. But I know you've said a lot of times that Central Ohio is a hotbed of singer-songwriters. How, how large a community is that? Well, it's growing every day. I mean, there's hundreds here. You know, we've got lightning in a bottle. Four years ago, when Natalie's opened and the McConnell Center opened, both in Worthington, there were no songwriter events going on at all. And I wanted to bring some of the taste of Nashville where I've been playing regularly in listening rooms, I wanted to try to bring that to my home city of Columbus. 
the McConnell Center and then Charlie Jackson here at Natalie's uh, took the risks to, to start a songwriter showcase. And now, four or five nights a week in Columbus, you can find open mics and songwriter nights. And you actually started a show, a TV show, called Songs at the Center on WOSU, as a matter of fact. Tell me about that show. Songs at the Center is a, a television series that showcases three or four songwriters every given show, and we, we, we are in a format, what we call the in-the-round format, where three or four songwriters will take turns singing individually, but yet when you put them together collectively, you get, you get a round, you get a, an entire show out of it. For the songwriter, it provides the opportunity to perform one-on-one -on -one with an audience, um, but yet not be alone on stage. For the audience, it provides variety. We get the advantage of the intimacy of the singer-songwriter experience, but yet you hear from three or four different songwriters, so you're hearing different sounds, different approaches. This has to be a huge boost for their careers. One of my goals with Songs at the Center was to raise the awareness of and therefore the value for what we do as singer-songwriters. And it does my heart good when I hear a a uh, songwriter tell me that they just sold CDs in Seattle or San Francisco or Chicago as a result of being on the show, or that they've been booked there. That's what we've been after uh, from the start. Did you expect it to, to grow as much and as fast as it has? We really expected it to be um, a successful local program that, that might have uh, legs beyond Columbus, but we never expected it less than a year later to be on 133 television stations across America in major markets. San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, uh, Charlotte, Las Vegas, um, Albuquerque. So what are your goals for the future? For, for the TV show, what are your goals for things here at Natalie's? My goal for Songs at the Center is, is really to be uh, a showcase for who we are in Columbus uh, musically and artistically. Every single aspect of our show represents who we are. And uh, to, to know that we're taking the lead in being ambassador for the music scene here in Columbus is just beyond uh, joyful for me. And Eric, you are such a promoter of these singer-songwriters. What advice would you give those who are aspiring to be singer-songwriter? Well, the, the advice that I would give to an aspiring songwriter is the same advice I give to uh, my peers and that I take for myself, and that is that we always have to continue growing and getting better. Learning from people who can do things with a song that we can't. And I would say to the Columbus community that we've got, a, we've got loads of talent here, but our challenge is to get better and better, to use Columbus as our home base but to continue to, to tour and go to other places and learn from the masters who um, have had great success and we can always get better. Um, we have top level songwriters here now, but the key is to keep growing and keep improving our craft. Well, Eric, it, it has been a pleasure to see you again. Really a pleasure to talk with you Thanks, too. Charlie. And best of everything with all of these enterprises that are going on now. Thanks. That's all right. You know, the DIY music scene in Columbus is thriving. It's full of young musicians who work full time by day and make music in their off time. Dee Dee is one such band. They describe their music as noisy pop. What's interesting is that each band member feels they're navigating many diverse worlds. And playing in Dee Dee allows them to express their unique identities through a common musical experience. You know, the thing about performing or doing your art is that you get to become whatever you want to be. Identity sounds like the stationary thing, but it, it moves. It moves through space and it changes. You know, if I go to Colombia, I can't really pass completely as Colombian. If I'm in the U.S., I can't really pass as white. So it's always just kind of like, I always felt in between. found the DIY scene and I got to see a bunch of people who are writing their own music and performing it, which I'd never seen at this level before. And it was really inspiring, but then I realized that it's mainly 
white people and it's a lot of guys. There, there aren't, um, there aren't very many women in the scene. You end up finding the other people of color in the room mm -hmm. and they become part of your people. That's where it all begins and that's something that's really close to our heart. We actually went to a forum sponsored by this thing called the Tiny House Music Collective. Uh, and it was a forum on race uh, and gender. We learned that people of color can have like a lot of difficulty booking shows in certain places. People of color might not be um, the first choice to be in a certain lineup of bands, right? So we learned a lot about how that happens, um, but also ways that we as musicians can sort of like try to empower other musicians. Dee Dee is the name of my grandmother and it's the name of our band. The photograph is of Dee Dee or Dorothy Sugawara Shimizu and her two sisters, Kathy and Gladys, um, after they got out of the internment camps after World War II. And then it turns out that like in other languages, Didi means like sister or aunt. In other ways it connected with just who we are. So it was really cool to be able to name our band like that would, you know, kind of immortalize her a little bit. You never you just never know who your family's gonna be sometimes. And who you're going to wind up becoming, who you're going to meet on the way and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like this is my, this is my family and these are the people that really get me. The John Glenn International Airport was first called a port, like what you'd find on a waterfront. How'd it get that name? Find out about that story and more at Curious Sea Bus, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wosu.org slash curious. Now we're going to go into the vault of the Ohio History Connection and find out what a pair of pants tells us about the music of Dwight Yoakam. A pair of pants? Mm hmm yeah, that's what it says in the teleprompter. Okay, a pair of pants it is. Let's press on. Doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm great, but either the Ohio History Connection is taking in laundry now, or this pair of jeans has something to do with the music display behind us. Yeah, it sure does. So these jeans are from our popular culture collection, and country musician and Northland High School graduate, Dwight Yoakam actually wore these on the cover of his 1987 album, Hillbilly Deluxe. Aha. Uh -huh. This isn't just a normal pair of jeans. What are these? The metal uh, plates you're talking about there are known as conchos, and um, they come from Mexico originally, but uh, they're a staple of Western wear, which is a fashion style that was popularized in the 40s, 50s, 60s uh, by country Western musicians like Hank Williams, Lefty Frizzell, Buck Owens, a lot of people that Dwight Yoakam actually listened to while he was growing up. And Yoakam's not from Columbus originally, right? Correct. He's actually from Eastern Kentucky. His family story is really part of a larger historical trend of people moving from App Appalachia up north to industrial cities like Columbus. He even references that in one of his songs, has a line about, about that migration, right? Certainly, yeah. Read and Write and, and uh, Route 23 kind of talks about that up, uh, northern migration of people uh, like the Yoakums who uh, were a coal mining family. Well, there's another item here. I don't think it's Mr. Yoakum's, but it is a musical item, and it looks like a conductor's baton. Yeah, this uh, conductor's baton belonged to Carl Honig, uh, who for nearly 40 years was the conductor of the Republican Glee Club of Columbus, Ohio. Was that a, a club of national significance? Uh, eventually, the, the club um, started off right here in Columbus, originally to support the presidential campaign of Ulysses S. Grant. So it started in 1872. It wouldn't be incorporated as a national organization until uh, the early 90s. And Honig, uh, what else did he do? Was he from Columbus or what, 
what were his other activities? Uh, Honig was also the choir director at the Trinity Church on East Broad Street and was also the choir director of uh, the Ohio State University Men's Glee Club, which is one of the oldest student organizations uh, at the school today. So music plays a part in Central Ohio community and here are two items that, that reflect that. Certainly. Certainly. Thanks for sharing them with us. Thanks for taking a look. Everyone knows there are a lot of people in Columbus with German or Irish ancestors. Turns out there's a lot of people here who trace their heritage to Wales as well. And music is an important part of Welsh culture. So here's a personal essay from Laura Thomas, a Clintonville resident who gets together with other Welsh descendants to celebrate their roots with traditional four-part hymns. One of the last remaining traditions that preserves the Welsh language in Ohio, brought here by Welsh immigrants, including my ancestors, is the Gamanva, the gathering for song. In the hills of southern Ohio and in the plains of central and western Ohio, people still gather to sing the hymns of the Welsh revival as they do in other states across the country. In big city churches and downtown hotels, North Americans of Welsh descent gather for the Gamanva. The hymns of this tradition were composed mainly in the late 1800s, and they're sung in four-part harmony, partly in English and partly in Welsh. Three essential things are needed for a Gamanva. A chorister who chooses the hymns and is skilled in leading the congregation with passion and enthusiasm, generating the spirit needed to lift the singing to greater heights. An accompanist who supports the effort of the song leader, following along as he repeats choruses at will, as many times as the excitement of the singers demands and most importantly, a gathering of as many sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses as the hosting community and the guests can provide, eager to lend their voices to the cause. And when the singing is over, we gather at the tebach, the tea. We eat the traditional Welsh tea cakes and enjoy one another's company. <laughs> to be born Welsh is to be not with a silver spoon in your mouth, but with music in your blood and poetry in your soul. Well, these are Welsh tea cakes. I, I used to make some, but I haven't made any for a while. But I'm getting too old. <laughs> for me, the Gamanva is part of my family heritage and identity. My Welsh grandfather reminded me frequently, as did my beautiful half-Welsh mother, that I had Welsh blood and should be proud of it. Four generations ago, my ancestors came directly from the Brecon area of Mid Wales to Ohio, bringing their language, music, and tenacious spirit. On my own pilgrimage to Wales, I took the advice of an old Welshman who told me, you need to drive up and over the Gospel Pass, and when you come down from the mountain, the valley you see in front of you belonged to your ancestors. Driving down that mountain in my rental car, it unfolded just as he said. And as I saw the beauty of the Welsh hills and the chapels where my ancestors worshiped and preached, I heard the echo of their voices and their songs. It brought home to me how these influences flavored my family life, and I believe some elements of my own stubborn personality. Why is this identity important? Is it important to preserve a language, a tradition? It's a question asked by many, whether recent immigrants or those seeking long-buried roots. For me, the answer is an obvious one. It's a source of strength, beauty, and pleasure. That's why I hope that the Gamanva will continue on into the future and the next generation, and why I'll do my part to make that happen. So now you know what a gamanva is. A gamanva is open to all, Welsh or not. Anyone who would like to hear the music is welcome. This is your introduction and your invitation to the gamanva.
Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Algren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.